I'm just welcoming you on behalf of the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. Um, we are housed within Berkeley Law, where this event is taking place. We host a robust visiting faculty and scholars program. And just to note that Yalina Teeth is both a former visiting professor of ours and hopefully also a future visiting professor of ours. Um, we sponsor courses across campus and we coordinate public academic and student programs of which this is one of ours. Um, and as I noted, there are some flyers for more information about a number of upcoming events this spring. Today you are joining us for the third session of a year-long series, most of which have been virtual. This is the one event in the series that is in person, um, but a year-long series entitled The Future of Shared Society in Israel, Shifting Lenses. In this series, scholars immersed in the project of shared society in Israel have been exploring issues of social trust, public policy, and current events shaping the prospects for coexistence and examining both opportunities for and barriers to building shared society in Israel. In our previous two sessions, our scholars explored these questions from the lens of law and gender, and also from the lens of civil society and education. Today, our scholars are going to be exploring this topic through the lens of dance and choreography. And in our fourth and last session, which will be a webinar on March 13th, our scholars will explore these issues from the lens of religion, another interesting viewpoint. Um, all of the, the recordings for this series will be available on our website. So bringing you back to the focus of today's program, our moderator, Sariel Balom, will engage Yali Natif and Netta Yerushalmi in a conversation about diversity in Israeli society through dance and choreography. They'll be exploring the dancing body as an imprinted cultural living archive through examples from Yerushalmi's work and those of other choreographers based in Israel. So I have the pleasure of introducing Sariel Golom, and then she's going to be introducing our other speakers here. Sariel is a PhD candidate in theater and performance studies at Stanford University. And her research explores corporeality, the politics of representation, and the erotics of the gaze in 20th and 21st century concert dance. Her writing appears in the Brooklyn Rail, ODC Dance Stories, Dance Research Journal, TDR, and the Articulate Body, Dance and Science in the Long 19th Century. She's the recipient of two Carl Weber Memorial Fellowships and a Selma Jean Cohen Award for Excellence in Graduate Dance Scholarship. And so I turn it over to you, and uh, thank you so much. As choreographers and dance researchers, some of the things we investigate uh, through and beyond dance itself have to do with the nature of the body and embodiment. For example, how is the body a mediator of culture, society, and nationhood? One answer might be in thinking of the body as an archive. It holds on to feeling, experience, memory, reference, language. In it, we carry the image of our parents and consequently notions of ancestry, ethnicity, religion, and intergenerational trauma. In being awake to these various levels in which uh, corporeality makes meaning, we might also think expansively about the notion of a body politic. Indeed, what does it mean to think of Israeli society itself as something of a contested body? constantly in motion. The choreographer and the dance researcher ask, how is it that through movement, the body makes meaning on all that it stands for? How can it comment upon these learned and lived practices of how we occupy space, time, and nationhood and what claims we have upon them? The body in motion allows us to understand how we can be with and alongside each other. And thus, there's deep potential within dance to explore the notion of a shared society and to trouble the illusion of society as premised upon sameness, instead considering relations across difference. Uh, Israel has emerged over the past several decades as a leading global site for contemporary dance, uh, which makes it a fascinating space for thinking about how dancers mobilize their bodies to speak on behalf of or speak back to culture and country. And we're joined today by two incredible perspectives on this subject, choreographer Netta Yerushalmi and scholar Dr. Yael Nativ, who will draw from work excerpts, historical overviews, and explanations of their creative methods 
to propose aesthetic and sociopolitical responses to the notion of a shared society. So I'm going to offer a bios for each of them before we get into their work. Neta Yerushalmi is a dance artist based mostly in New York, sometimes in Tel Aviv. Her work aims to engage with audiences by imparting the sensation of things as they are perceived, not as they are known, and to challenge how meaning is attributed and constructed. Most recently recognized with a 2022 United States Artist Fellowship, Netta is the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, a research fellowship at the New York Public Library for Performing Arts, and a Foundation for Contemporary Arts Award. Her work has been commissioned and presented by venues such as Jacob's Pillow, the Joyce Theater, American Dance Festival, New York Live Arts, and the Guggenheim Museum, as well as national and international residencies, universities, and repertory companies. Netta works across genres and disciplines. She contributed to artist Josiah McKelleny's Prismatic Park at Madison Square Park, choreographed a Red Hot Chili Peppers music video, worked with cellist Maya Beiser and composer Julia Wolf on spinning, and collaborated on evenings of theory and performance at the Institute for Cultural Inquiry. As a performer, Netta has worked with artists such as Pam Tanowitz Dance, Doug Verone and Dancers, and the Metropolitan Opera Ballet. She grew up in Galilee, Israel, and received her BFA in dance from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, where she currently teaches. Dr. Yael, or Yali Natif, is a dance scholar and educator working within the disciplines of sociology, anthropology, and cultural studies. She is a senior lecturer at the School for Society and Arts, the Academic Ono, and Levinsky College for Education, all in Tel Aviv, as well as the Mason Gross School of the Arts online at Rutgers. Yali holds a diploma in dance education from the Kibbutzim College in Tel Aviv, a bachelor's in choreography from the Sorbonne, and a master's in interdisciplinary education of the creative arts from San Francisco State. She received her PhD in sociology of education from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. In her writing and research, Yali explores social and cultural issues, mostly in the Israeli realm, looking at the linkage between dance, body, culture, education, gender, and creativity. Her book, Fractured Freedom, Body, Gender, and Ideology in Dance Education in Israel, which she co-wrote with Dr. Kodel Ophir, was published in 2016. Currently, Yali is engaged in ethnographic research, looking at the experience of the body among aging Israeli professional dancers who still perform on stage. She is co-founder and member of the Israeli Society for Dance Research and serves as the head of the board of directors of the Israeli Association of Independent Choreographers. Alongside Iris Lana, Yali runs Creatures of Dance, a podcast on contemporary dance in Israel, which is in both Hebrew and English, and is a former visiting professor at UC Berkeley's Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies, as sponsored by the Helen Diller Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And I believe we're going to begin with a brief excerpt from Netta's 2022 work, Movement. Mm -hmm. yeah.
thank you for being here. Thank you, Serial. Thank you um, so much to Rebecca. And uh, I just want to say, as an artist uh, in the field of dance, it's rather unusual for a department inside of a law school to be welcoming somebody to talk about dance. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank you, Rebecca, and thank you all for being here um, to, to consider uh, what we're going to be considering through this somewhat unusual perspective. It's not unusual to me. It's what I've been doing my whole life, but it might be un somewhat unusual. Um, and uh, so that's that. And I want to, before Yali kind of uh, uh, takes the helm, I want to speak a little bit about what we just looked at. Um, I, it's not the Q&A time, but I would be so curious to hear what you saw since I didn't frame it verbally before starting, and so you had the experience of just looking at that and trying to figure out what the hell you're looking at. But um, I will tell you that that excerpt is towards the end of a piece that lasts about 67 minutes, and the entire piece is made of citation from existing dances. So this sort of, this sort of, um, uh, practice of quilting is how I, how I have talked about this work, taking existing movement and uh, stitching it together in idiosyncratic, juxtaposed, highly, you know, highly controlled by me ways in order to bring together a very, very kind of, um, uh, uh, let's see, a very a varied mix of movement idioms and cultures into one um, kind of pastiche, one, one work. And we end in the piece in this gesture that I'm going to call broadly the folk, right? So we have, we land towards the end of the piece in folk dancing as the sort of maybe the beating heart of movement uh, uh, as dance and choreography as it's expressed most broadly, maybe around the world. And in this excerpt that you saw um, stitched together are folk dances from from Senegal, from uh, Korea, from Israel, from uh, uh, you know Swan Lake, Petipa, um, from I, you know I can't e I can't even remember all the different places. Um, and at the very end of the piece, you started to see a little bit of what we do, um, what we project on stage, which are citations for all of the movement that we've taken. Um, so we're starting this talk today by thinking about sort of a kind of the body as bodies as archives, um, movement as already existing in our bodies, in your bodies. Dance is something that happens everywhere in its varied forms and trying to kind of elevate that and pay attention to it and pull it out of us um, and bringing, bringing forth citations from the dancers who say how they've learned it and how that movement has come into their body is, is, is one way, is the way that I've chosen and we chose to sort of elevate that reality. Um, so I think, I think uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you, or to you. Great. Yeah, well, so you're taking this very expansive notion of the word folk, which I think is incredibly generative, um, and thinking about folk as kind of a form that is tied to land and space and time, mm -hmm. and obviously a very significant aspect of body culture in Israel itself. <laughs> yes. um, and so I'm wondering, Yali, do you wanna give us a little bit of background on, um, on Israeli dance, on <clears throat> folk ideology? Yeah. Yes, certainly. Before I do, I just want to thank um, Neta for coming all the way from the East Coast to sit here and talk with me. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and thank you, Rebecca, for making this happen, and Sariel, of course. And yes, I will, uh, I will start with this, and then... Hello. 
So who in the audience recognizes this piece? Okay, not bad. <laughs> so um, this is Achad Mi Yodea, Who Knows One in English, from the Jewish Passover traditional dinner, dinner ceremony, made as part of Kiel, Wall uh, in English, Wall in English, yeah. The first work of Ahad Narin to the Bacheva Dance Company in 1990, performed here by middle school kids in Tanya. This is where I live, it's my city in Israel in 2016 under the title Flash Mob Echad Mi Yodea. Now a flash mob, as you probably know, is the action of people coming together, sort of like unexpectedly, performing a sort of sequence of movements and then disappear. And I'm showing it here because the concept of flash mob is based on the active ownership of the people, of something that is common and shared. And if we want to talk about body as an archive, a living archive, which is ever changing in the Israeli context, then I think that this is a good example that shows how a contemporary dance piece becomes an agent or a mediate, mediation platform for a specific movement DNA that represents in itself some notion of an embodied canonic Israeliness to the wider Israeli Jewish society. Because, you know, if we see it done in schools, performed by kids all over the country in different ceremonies that are usually related with nationhood, and we do see it, it could be done as part of the Independence Day celebrations or Jerusalem Day celebrations, then it does say something about how current Israeli society perceives itself and its embodied cultural traditions and origin. Now, the original um, Kir, it's interesting to mention because at the time, Naharin created Kir and Echad Mi Yodea as a critique, asking about the deconstructing the ethos of the heroic Israeli society and body. And as you can see here in these images from the early 19s version of Echad Mi Yodea, the dancers are dressed with a common sabra, khaki kind of a kibbutz or palmachni clothes, like palmachni is the uh, troops of that fought uh, before there was um, the army, the IDF, with a temple head. How do you say temple head? English? Uh, it has a name in English, no? No. Bucket, bucket cap. Bucket? Bucket cap. Okay, thank you. <laughs> head seated in a semi-circle, which I will refer to in a minute. So, and just to say a few words about this body, while well, Ohad Narin himself is considered as mayor, as a mayor's pre representation of this new Israeli body, the Sabra, the Kibbutznik, which is called uh, by uh, anthropologist Meira Weiss, the chosen body, a body that is regulated, cared for, and ultimately made perfect, in her words. And here we see Max Broad, the father of the Zionist muscular Judaism concept, who called for the return of the physical, biblical, strong, and heroic Jewish body, a concept that became fundamental for the construction of this cho chosen new Israeli body, the Sabra, that served the image of the Chalutz, the Jewish pioneer, immigrant male, white Ashkenazi, of course, who was working the land and building the new state to come, and of course, the image of the Israeli soldier. So if we go back to the circle for a minute, it is a basic form of choreography in any folk dance. And in the Israeli context, it represents the Hora, the emblem, of the holy secular spirit of the new Jewish olim in the beginning of the 20th century, as Oz Almog describes it. But in fact, the Hora, as well as other Israeli folk dances uh, of the time, were based on a corpus of movement knowledge brought from Europe by Jewish Ashkenazi immigrants, relived, reimagined, and recreated 
to fit its new ideology and locality. So in the context of our discussion today, we can see how the Jewish pioneers carried in their bodies their own traditional archives and reused them to construct their new identity in their new home. So just to show an example, this is an example of a Polish dance, folk dance. Matko, matko, Jasko idzie! see the similarities, right? So if I go back to Ahad Miyodea, the full circle in Ohad, Narin, um, in Ohad Narin dance is broken. So the, the full circle is not there. And the dancers are taking off their clothes, sort of like unmasking their identity. The music is pounding. It's by the tractor revenge rock, rock uh, um, music band live on stage the first time ever in the 90s that uh, something like this is happening. And the dance is very, very physical, very, very um, um, harsh. So let's have a, a look at the current version of Ohad Narin Zechad Miyodea. It's been like this in the last, I don't know, 15 years. They are no longer with the khaki and the tembo hat. Um, let me see. Um, let me show. <laughs> Um, looking at how this Echad Mi Yodea by Ohad Na'arin, which is a contemporary piece, becomes a canonic so, so, so kind of a repertoire for um, teenagers and the educational system in Israel becoming the archive of the tradition of uh, Israel and Israel um, history and legacy. Um, so Ohad Na'arin um, basically in the 90s opened the door I think for other choreographers to comment on these issues, uh, the Israeli body, the embodiment of Israeli society, militarism and the place of ceremonies and collective memories in today's Israel. And I will show here two examples. One is Renan Arraz with this piece that is called, as uh, we were called to go in Hebrew, Karul Anul Alechet, that has a reference with um, the culture of the army it means in the army, let's go to, um, to fight, let's go to the war, let's go to uh, de defend our country. 
And let's watch, and then we can um, talk about it a little bit. So, um, do you want to say what you see here, or can you can you notice a layer of like um, a comment? Yes. All the old and new. Old and new. Yeah. What else? Well, there is a level of cynicism if you can notice over the dramatization of the ethos and the pathos of the Israeli ceremonies. And then this woman here, which is Renana's sister, and this is Renana's father, by the way, that she put him on stage for the first time ever and the last time. <laughs> and um, she's like moving in like in this broken kind of movement. So there, there is a comment here about who we are today. What is this ethos for us? What does it mean in the 2000s, and of course, there is all these representations of, of the props. You know, the, the map of uh, the, the Israel and the, um, the um, villon, no? curtain. the curtain that is white and, and blue, and so on. So this is one example. The second example would be by public movement, and it's the summer of 2011 by uh, Dana Yalomi. Public movement is a performance group that investigates the choreography of the state in Israel. And as in the summer of 2011, there was a massive protest against the cost of living, if you remember, not the situation today. Um, it was happening mainly in Tel Aviv, and public movement used the Hora, um, this well-established archival collective knowledge for Jewish Israeli citizens, yeah, to disrupt everyday routine and traffic in center Tel Aviv. So we can see how this embodied archive can be used to glorify the state from one hand and its people, but also used as a political tool to protest against it. And it looks like this. So on, so on. <laughs> okay, back to you, Saria. Yeah, I'd love to. Can I ask you a couple questions yes. before you move on? Yeah. So, first of all, I think in this we see not only like the the invocation of folk forms, but also kind of trying on for size these different um, images, like kind of icons of Judaism. So, you know, not only the new Jew, but also we have kind of this Hasidic reference mm -hmm. in Echad Miodea, and then there's the kind of Kibbutznik in the next mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, they, they seem kind of ironic, maybe mm -hmm. even antagonistic, or, or I don't know if you want to talk at all about what, what the attitude is towards these sort of body identities. Well, I think there is a lot of critique and a lot of reflection 
of Israeli choreographers looking at their own culture and um, backgrounds, traditions, and maybe I would say even hegemonic, hegemonic um, um, embodiment or the power of the, uh, of the Israeli body that was a kind of reconstituted um, during um, the state, the, the statehood, and especially through education, through all these ceremonies that, you know, all Israeli kids, they have to stand and they have to march in a certain way. So I think that in the, since the 2000s, and Ohad Narin was like an early bird of this coming and kind of boom, uh, introducing this, this line of thought. But since then, I think um, there is a constant thinking and rethinking about what does it mean to be an Israeli body and uh, are there any other types of body and who can be seen and who is not seen in these like major institutional uh, platforms and so on. Mm -hmm. I'm also struck as we, you know, think about the body as archive, the ways in which um, with Echad Miodea that it, even in hearing it, if you know it, you're called into wanting to sing along and mm -hmm. to kind of into if memory. Jewish, yes, yeah. yeah. And it's, if you're a dancer, you kind of yeah. see it and you're like, oh yes, that choreography, of course, mm -hmm. iconic. And then, um, you know, with the Hora as well, I'm, I don't know if you want to comment at all about this sort of like the ways in which it calls an audience into being. Maybe Neta can call. call. That. I'm called into, <laughs> well, I, um, yeah, I watch those, those dances and I, it's very hard for me to sit down. So mm -hmm. I feel uh, both uh, joy, but also sort of like, I don't have control over my body. Something's pulling it, right? And sort of maybe that's what, um, em like maybe that's what embodied unity does. Maybe that's why we have these folk dances, so that we have this sort of like subliminal physical um, deep connection that we are not even s that aware of. Mm -hmm. And of, of course, music plays a huge thing. I mean, it's the, the songs and the rhythms that we are also so familiar with that pull us mm -hmm. towards one another. So um, I'm just struck by the unifying force of all this. Um, and curious also to hear later on if, if other people have visceral experiences of the sort, which I'm sure you do. I want to add this. Here you go. I just want to add that, um, first of all, I think public movement, this is what they are kind of um, count on. They count on people coming in and re cannot resist. But I also want to say that it's not like straightforward black and white um, cynicism or irony and resistance and versus, um, you know, the, the sense of belonging or, and community. I think it's kind of more complicated than that okay. because... Um, Yes, there is a lot of um, love and care for our country and our identity and our history, including all of this. And with this comes a layer of reflectivity and, and critique about looking at it and trying to see what can we do with this and how can we expand these boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually is kind of a beautiful transition into Meta's work. I think we're going to be looking at a little bit of um, your 2014 work, Helga and Three Sailors, mm -hmm. in which you're also sort of playing with this question of trying on for size movement that maybe you've embodied before, different versions. Yeah, yeah I think um, I, I can say before we look at this that I... Um, I spent a lot of years thinking, I think trying in New York, trying to sort of un-Israelify mm -hmm. or, or to just wonder, I, it wasn't an active thing of resistance, but I sort of wondered uh, outside of that narrative who, who I was as an artist and who I was as a body. And um, uh, I think we, we'll look at this, but... Um, Maybe I won't say anything yet, and then we'll talk over it a little yeah, bit. Okay. okay. Can from 33, I think we said would 38. be 38. You're right. Uh, all the footage you see is um, it's me. <laughs> Thank you. 
so I, I'll just share that um, in this work, well, this is going to go on for a while, so you can look at me doing the same thing a million times. Um, I used videos of myself as a dancing child as ostensibly a sort of primary text, which I studied very, very closely in an attempt to sort of um, find out what, what was inside this child's body and like, is that still the same body? So this idea of sort of psycho psychoanalysis in this bizarre way um, and sort of trying on her to check if we're, you know, where, where we align. But I treated the videos that I found as, um, with, the, with the assumption that this little child was sort of a virtuosic dancer that knew what they were doing. Um, which of course is not true because it's, it's just a child moving around, but from the perspective of me as a hyper-trained person, I wanted to sort of treat everything that I saw in these videos as intentional and to see how that felt and to learn from that about sort of the layers that were inside um, this child's body. Like, um, and there, most of them are in, in my home in the Galilee, with my mom and my sister are in the back. Can you talk about um, the element of repetition here, like why you're sort of doing this as a feedback loop in a way? Yeah, I mean, there's something about like how we learn how to move by repeating. We, we learn like in the ways in which we are, are all, you are all also choreographed, your bodies are choreographed because you do things with your bodies repeatedly, um, which is also true about our emotional and our mental groups, like we repeat the way we think and we talk and we feel and then those things become what we are. Um, there's also of course a sort of like um, a, a choreographic device here of getting stuck inside of something that's about movement. There's something about time, right? Time kind of stops, we're st stuck in it. Um, the ability to see a certain, the ability to see details of movement by going again and again and again and again and again to perceive and to, to stay in that tension of moving and not moving. Maybe you see other things. Can I say? I think there is something interesting about Netta, the child who is in the, in the Galilee, Israel, and Netta, the older woman who is in New York City, uh, looking at, you know, at this like space between these two um, Nettas, I think it's really interesting culturally, and the way you kind of um, uh, abstract. Yeah, abstract the movement. And the repetitions are happening also in the video, so you kind of manipulated the video as, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the rest of the piece sort of, uh, when, when we'll get to an excerpt of it later, but the rest of the piece is sort of all about me trying to move within this sort of uh, idiom, this sort of vocabulary of movement that I found in uh, these videos. There's something interesting about in thinking about the body as an archive, like what it is to access a memory of childhood, not mm -hmm. through kind of trying to tap into the memory itself, but from externally watching yeah. a video of oneself. Exactly. Yeah. Well, watching and then trying to do it with, with, with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's something about sort of that as a trained dancer, you can kind of think about like, oh, wh what are the things I can't do anymore mm -hmm. because of how indoctrinated I am or <clears throat> and I'll say um, just uh, what's not available in these videos because that dancer is too young is all the stuff that Yali talked about since in my in my later years I did all of the things so this sort of like way in which I I Israeli dancing came uh, came to be so potent, uh, both the folk dancing and the Ohad Narin, Echad Kir, these kind of iconic um, uh, cultural emblems were, were, are deep inside of me and that comes up, well, in the, in the excerpt that we showed in the beginning and maybe stuff that we'll show later, but just to say that I am not, um, I didn't get a pass. <laughs> I was injected with those intense uh, dance ideologies as well and uh, maybe we see a beginning of it here. Mm -hmm. 
I, I get, as you're, as, as you're older, you just get more indoctrinated, right? Yeah. And also we started to settle the Galilee more as I got older. This is the end. Thank you. I think this is the end. It's also interesting to think that you can stop it. Israeli dance in some ways is such a thing, both in Israeli dance like folk forms, but also there's kind of an aesthetic to contemporary Israeli dance. And here we have a version of Israeli dance, which is an Israeli doing a dance of an Israeli, mm -hmm. of a dancer in Israel, but it is so kind of decontextualized through various layers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of my issue with, be, with being an Israeli dancer in New York is people saying, oh, you're an, you do Israeli dance. It's like, what the hell is that? And no, I don't because <laughs> I studied to under, I studied how to, well, maybe I do do Israeli dance, but insofar as it's, I'm an Israeli, not insofar as I, um, I, lear I learned how to make dances mostly in, in, in New York, but you carry everything with you. But this, this idea that now internationally there's a sense of what Israeli dance is, and I, yeah, I push back against that for myself just because, uh, yeah, I think it's more complicated than that. Um, do we, should we show the other excerpt? Yeah, or, yeah do we have time? Um, it's the second helicopter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we're starting like at 50. So this is uh, towards the end of that solo, which lasts about 20 minutes. And we're just going to show a little bit. Um, no, 50, <coughs> that's, that's, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so this obviously, the section of Helga is very different from the other one in that your process is a little bit more opaque and, and there's this kind of funhouse quality to it. I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit what we're looking at and what's changed from the section previously that we looked at. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, like as I said before, the, the solo, which um, uh, is it's about 25 minutes or whatever, all, all of the material is sort of infected by the kind of embodied, um, the vocabulary and the embodied sensibility that I culled from the video. So um, at, at the end, I'm sort of, sort of riding that wave, white, riding that sort of um, body of knowledge that I culled, I culled from this kid. And I'm also reflecting on sort of like, I mean, and then I chose to put an Israeli song in there mm -hmm. and to, so the, the thing I said a moment ago about trying to distance myself from the Israeliness, sort of then, and then I can't resist it. I can't help it. I have to put the song on there in order to feel like that mm -hmm. child that I wasn't, to feel like me. I have to put that song there and I have to make a fool of myself and do all these little weird things to feel, sort of like be, really be there. Um, and so I think I'm playing with sort of like hyper subjectivity and like hyper like uh, like whirling around myself and then but the piece is situated in a white kind of sterile kind of stage and the, the trio of the dancers are doing these sort of like linear kind of like super abstracted sort of desubjectified stuff uh, if we saw more of what so I'm, I'm sort of playing with that with that um, as a way, yeah, as a way to sort of elevate, or not elevate, but shine some light on kind of what it, mean, what it means to like dig almost too far into mm -hmm. to me or to, to anyone to kind of pull material out of it, uh, use it as, a cre as an artistic work, but also as something that to, to makes us think about what's inside of us. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So what is on the other end of digging too far into something? Because this is also, I think, a theme of movement is you talk about that it's about pluralism to the point of snapping, you know? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, we could, we could talk about that. Yeah, I mean, movement is about... We, we can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I want to think about that question for a second. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe you should talk about the other solos. Yeah. Yep. Yali's going to talk about some other yeah. other works, but what's interesting about them is I didn't know about them, and now because of this event, I'm learning about them. But they're also um, artists who sort of delve into themselves to to create. Totally subjective, <laughs> yeah. not desubjectified, but totally subjective. Right. So, if my previous example showed some critical references to the uh, Zionist historical ideology narrative, I want to show two young uh, women choreographers. Um, and who are interested in some different directions. Uh, one is Nur Garabli. Uh, she's a Palestinian woman citizen of Israel who grew up in Jaffa and trained as a dancer um, on Western dance, you know, classical ballet, um, some modern contemporary dance, studied at the Kibbutzim uh, College where I studied. And this piece is called Hakovshim Alembi. It's from 2021. And Hakovshim Alenbi, in fact, it's a junction of two streets in center Tel Aviv, or kind of like south of in South Tel Aviv. And Hakovshim in Hebrew means the conquerors and the occupiers, or the occupiers. And Alenbi was the Field Marshal Alenbi, British Imperial Governor of Palestine, that there is a street um, upon his name. And um, Noor is looking at these um, symbolic also, um, geogra geographical place, Tel Aviv, which, and she comes from Jaffa, the old town of Chap Jaffa, and um, she's uh, making her comments, and we will see a bit from that. Uh, let's see, should I just swear? Thank you. Do you have
So I'll just stop for a minute. There's a lot of to unpack here, if you can see. She's using her archives, or multiple archives of movement, um, um, the, the belly dance, the arm music, the shaking of, of, of the pelvis, and then some movement from classical ballet class, you know, when she's kind of uh, jumping around. She's using the language, yalla, yalla, and she's kind of deconstructing this word, an Arab word that became, became you know, like a keyword, uh, very, very usable in Hebrew. And all these uh, props around that, that are very symbolic. And if you notice the, the floor, the oriental floor that is kind of here made of PVC, of plastic. Um, so it's a, it's a comment on herself as an as Arab, Palestinian, Israeli woman in Israel today and on these split identities that she's experiencing, of course, and, and also the occupation situation. And we talked yesterday when we were, were watching it and Netta said something about her attitude about like she's bringing it like this, this is me and here I am. And I'm dancing for you in a very provo provocative way that this is also, I think, her way to um, fight for her voice, for her place in the Israeli society as a whole and also in the Israeli dance scene where there are not many um, Arab um, dancers, choreographers, teachers, um, and they don't have much visibility. And also they have some difficulties in their own, uh, of course, um, societies, being dancers, being women who dance with their bodies and showing their bodies uh, sometimes um, is, is criticized and not looked very, um, they, 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 it's not supported. So let's look a little bit more and then move to the other one. Oh. And there is the dabke, of course, the folk um, music and Arab dance with, with the feet. Um. So this was um, no, and the last example I'm showing is. Um, Does she still live in Yaffa? Yes. Yes. So this is uh, Stav's truth. Stav comes from a very different direction. She was born in Jerusalem to a Georgian family. She was educated in traditional Western dance education, ballet, contemporary dance. She danced from Bache for Bacheva for a long time. And recently, it happened during COVID, as she said, she became interested in her own Georgian traditional archived body and launched this extensive research looking for materials on YouTube. She didn't have much from home, from parents. And um, she interviewed older family members in Georgia. She went to Georgia to study um, dance. And Sepia mm -hmm. is her first work dealing with these materials working with a traditional martial dance that used to be performed by men only, and now she calls it a feminine martial dance. And um, she's really doing an incredible job.
see across both of these people playing with the question of the, the idioms that live in one's body and like what it actually means to take a folk form and mm -hmm. put it on stage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does this feel like something used commonly in the contemporary dance scene in Israel well, right now? Well, I think in Israel it's like happening now in the last maybe of five, six, seven years where people like stuff or um, Noor or Oli Portal that I wanted to show, but we don't have time, I think, today. They really look into their own traditions, their home, their growing up situation and environment, kind of breaking out of, they dare to break out of the Israeli body and what it means. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And these feel like, it seems like they're trying to search for the synthesis of, of these. Well, they're, they're using, I think, contemporary mechanism, mm -hmm. Conte dance, con contemporary dance, con con contemporary choreography, contemporary aesthetics, mm -hmm. and, and a contemporary research of movement to do that. And um, I think the fact that they're using these contemporary tools creates this integration that you're talking about. It's, um, it's not the folk dance that used to be. Mm -hmm. It's a new layer, a new, something new that they are kind of associate with mm -hmm. and present to the world. And if I may say something to end my thing, yeah. So I just wanted to refer to Avishai Margalit, um, who is a philosopher at the Hebrew University. And he asked in his book, asks in his book, uh, The Ethics of Memory from 2002, who has to remember? What does reliving cultural memories mean? And he says that memory is about the notion of care. And the healing power of knowing the past is fundamental to communal memories. I think that if we want to talk about a shared society in Israel or any other place for, the ma for that matter, then the notion of looking back to the past and reliving the past involves idea about how we remember and how we take care, care of and respect emotions in people's individual and collective various cultural archives, in our case, embodied archives. And I think that brings us nicely to mm -hmm. the end with what Leta wants mm -hmm. to show, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm wondering, um, for people sitting here, those of you who can feel your bodies, because it's very cold in here, so we might have just like 81% left of sensation, but what it, do, are your bodies, I'm just curious, I mean, maybe you don't have to answer, but just to think about what, what's happening in your body right now after having watched these things and heard us kind of like hammer at the body, the body, the body, the moving body, just, um, I'm just curious that what, what that does, um, because, the, the movement which we started with, the piece um, we started with in the green costumes, we're just going to show a little bit more of that before we start um, having a little conversation with y'all. And um, the, the, the idea in, in that piece is that, like, is to bring kind of a pluralistic kind of celebratory um, manifestation of moving in, in its various uh, forms, especially post-COVID. I mean, the piece was conceptualized before, but after COVID, it just was like, fuck it, we all need to come together and be with our bodies next to each other and do things together mm -hmm. as close as we can be and as, 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 as much heat we can generate in our bodies together. And um, uh, we included in that, in that, in that piece any, anywhere from you know, wedding ceremonies to ways in which people say hello to, to you know, I, could, I can conceptualize how you're sitting right now as a certain kind of learned pattern of movement. Um, so I just wanted to say that to just frame the little um, excerpt that we're going to show to end, and then um, unless you want to add anything. Okay. So this is a, in the middle towards the end, in the, somewhat in the middle towards the end. Do we have time left? Do I have a time code? I think we'll just start there. Sham, sham. Can, can, can. Can, can.
Well, my comment is the athleticism on display is incredible in all these clips. And I was, I was wondering, when you're on the stage, any of you, like, do you ever get like in the zone where your movements just take over and you're like on another plane almost like, I hear about athletes doing that on a big stage and they yep. do something incredible. Is that, and especially yours with your, with your uh, reimagining of your childhood member of childhood dance is like, it's so repetitive, like it's so impressive how you managed to accomplish that. Like, were you conscious of what you were doing on stage at a certain point or did you just get like a runner's high, so to speak, or like you were you some, like, how does that work? for any, any of you on the stage? Um, what? Sure. So the question was about um, how, like when you are dancing, do you get in such a zone that you're kind of having a runner's high or what is the kind of state of consciousness you're in? Right, I think there are many answers to that question. I think um, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing something that you know really well and you've done many times and it doesn't require um, a, a certain kind of like alert, in, in, alertness, then you can, you can get into a kind of like, it's not a runner type, but it's muscle memory, the thing that you're referring to, like my body. And I'm, in, I'm suggesting in, in today that many of us has, have ways in which we don't think about what we're doing with our body and we just do it, right? So which is runner's high, right? The runner just kind of just gets going, gets off on some kind of, uh, muscle memory and chemical and all that but uh, in in response to your comment about my the solo i'm counting like a crazy person i'm worried that i'm not with her i can't barely see her i um i'm worried about i'm not worried i'm thinking about my, the, my facial expressions <coughs> as opposed to the so i'm thinking about a lot of things so it depends what piece you're performing um that thought press is going to change. But there definitely is a muscle memory thing, which is sort of what we're talking about here. It wouldn't work to teach us all to do things if we, if we forgot. But since we remember, it becomes part of us. I can say to that that um, it's called the flow. And there is um, a psychologist who writes about it. His name is Mikhail Chik Mihai. Really, really difficult name. And my students, when I, well, the, the young students, girls that I interviewed for my PhD, asking them, what do you feel when you dance in high school in Israel? Why are you coming? Why, why are you doing this? They talked about the high. They didn't have the words. But they said, oh, we feel like we are disconnected from the world. We feel like we're flying. We feel like it's the best thing ever happened to us. And when you look at it from the outside, you know, a dance class is doesn't look like that at all because people are counting and there is the music and the teacher is saying things and they have to be in sync with other people and it's hard and it's physical and their inner experience is so different from what you see from the outside so I think it can happen in many situations in a dance class in well love making <laughs> in uh, running and in dancing not necessarily on the stage and he talks about, yes, athletes and musicians, pianists, who talk about this situation. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about the cultural differences versus the universality that you're kind of referring to. Because the, you kind of highlighted very different cultural norms or cultural roots. Um, and yet, I think we like to believe that music and dance are. I'm not sure what, what you're highlighting. I'm curious what you think of that. Where are you coming from? I'm going to add to that before you answer. Um, I was going to ask about, um, related to what you were asking. So, part of the uh, title of this series, if I understand it correctly, is talking about shared society here today, shared society for the dance and choreography in Israel. And, um, Question number one, as far as I understand Israeli society, there's a lot less of the uh, school kids, you know, doing uh, the, the folk dances or the standing in line like you were describing some of them. So um, how much of this, of what we're talking, what you were all referring to about the, um, you know, the, the history of, you were 
raised in Israel with the uh, with muscle memory of Israeli dance. Do you see it existing in Israel still today? Um, and not to mention, uh, Arab, I'm very happy that you uh, gave a representation of one of the few uh, Arab dancers, but um, shared society and in Israel now versus you know when you were growing up um, in, in relation to what you were saying. So the questions were about the sort of tensions between universality and cultural difference, as well as whether um, Israeli society, this notion of a shared society, whether Israeli culture still kind of has the same body culture and relationship to dance, maybe that it did when that's what's growing up. Or maybe where where is where is what's the place of dance today in a shared Israeli society, and can it have more of a place? Oh well, that's a huge question. Um, well, to the universal, universality question, I think universal is easy. I think we can recognize what's universal, universal. We can recognize bodies. We can recognize feelings. We can recognize wantings and needs. I think um, diversity and different differences are more difficult. And I think that this works on this kind of spectrum of, um, to me, um, difference uh, to make a difference is more important than to look for similarity because well there is this sociologist Michael Walter he talks about the politics of difference and he says that unless we acknowledge um, each other's differences we will never be able to dialogue and to talk and to connect and um, to your question in this relation um, Israel is a dancing country it's a dancing state Jewish Israel has, you know, the folk movement dance, and people dance all the time. They go to Har Kadot, you know, what Har Kadot is, yeah. Um, uh, and in terms of diversity and shared, and, and, and thought of thinking of, of how to share um, cultural diversity, I turn to the arts. I think the arts, do, they do the best job. The dancers, the musicians, the theater, the visual arts in Israel are very active in opening voices and uh, share voices and interact and integrate. I'm not talking about the state. The state is a different story, especially now. Yes. Well, that's my answer. <laughs> I, I, I'll just say something tiny about your question about universality is just sort of like, um, which might just be super obvious, but um, in, in, in making that peace movement, which sort of, again, has like hundreds of citations from all over, this idea that, that, the fo that you, you stand next to somebody and you hold, your hand, you hold their hand and you do something rhythmic and repetitive together and you all know it and that feels good. Yeah. Uh, landing there was sort of interesting for me. Like I hear your, your, I hear your point about not looking for similarity, we're looking for difference, no, but I there was some- not looking. Just to make it more of an effort for the for difference. For difference. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but somehow in a cult in a, in a in a in a world that's pulled towards these like constant difference mm -hmm. with the things, the mana, the simplicity of uh, the feeling of simplicity. No matter where the folk dance came from, it was a bunch of people standing next to each other in a line or in a circle, holding hands and doing something that was and everybody could just kind of do it together no matter what your political beliefs are or whatever, you just did it. And that was the way that people danced together all over the world. And it was just simple, like, okay, this is how, this is how people dance all over the world. And it's, and it's beautiful and it's simple and it's unison. And mm -hmm. does unison mean fascism? I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> well, just... different views on that. Right, mm -hmm. but sort of, um, yeah, yeah. Yep. Does that, does that mean yes. <laughs> um, so, when we're thinking about this notion of a shared society, <clears throat> I'm just thinking of, we saw examples here both of many works that work on the proscenium stage and sort of concert dance setting, mm -hmm. sort of more private and closed settings. We also saw examples of dances staged in public spaces, flash mobs, etc. I'm curious how you sort of think about the differences between the private enclosure of the proscenium stage setting and the context for dance versus those more public works that notion of publicity uh, that comes along with some of the flash mobs that we saw and that kind of thing. How does that figure into the sort of conception of what dance has to say about and for a shared society? 
So the question but was... Is there a certain purchase to the publicity of those dances that you had something to contribute to that? The question was about um, how the relationship uh, between public and private sort of plays out in the, the place where dance is staged, whether that's in a kind of private theater or out in public. Um, yeah. I mean, my thought about, uh, I think we, this is, should be our last, yes, we're about, I, I, my thought is, um, well, that art is often framed in a frame, right, so that we know that it's art, or so, right, so there's, 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 there's frames around that being what it is, so I think dance happening in the theater, it's not necessarily, pr it's private, but anybody can buy a ticket, maybe not anybody, it depends on a, a couple of, uh, yeah. So it's framed, <laughs> it's um, it's framed in that way, and that's a good thing, but, or it, it is what it is. Um, during COVID, an interesting thing happened where it was sort of like as somebody, I mean, I need a special floor to be able to dance in. I need a special container for sound so that you can hear my composer's music. I need the temperature to be right so that my body works. Like there's all kinds of annoying like high maintenance things that make my art what it is. It's like not my art if I'm dancing on concrete with sneakers. It is my art but it's different. So during COVID it was sort of like well isn't I, I'm going to still make my art. It has to be outside. It has to be in non-conventional spaces. It has to be public. I staged a performance without the permission of the city. There was a drunk party over there. There was a yoga class over there. there and, I, and I was on a, I took over an amphitheater. I invited an audience. They sat, sat 5,000 you know, feet away from each other. And we did a performance. And it was amazing. And it made me feel like this is the thing that we should be doing mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. So you sacrifice. You don't do the, you're not barefoot. You don't do all the 20 years of learning how to dance barefoot. You know, put your sneakers on and dance in the park with the drunk people so that public can, you know, come in and out of it and maybe a different kind of exchange could happen. So I'm with you. Dance is a rarefied form. Nobody wants to go into a theater. They'd rather watch Netflix. I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> maybe COVID gave us the answer. <laughs> Well, I'll just say that in Israel, this question is um, on the table and that there are many, many dancers and choreographers who work uh, with communities outside in, in the public sphere. And um, it's an ongoing project. It's not easy, as Neta says, but it's on the table, definitely. And since I think COVID made a, a great, great um, change at the whole of, of on, in the thinking of what is dance for and who is it for and how it's it can be more available and accessible to people. Yeah. Okay. I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.